previously on Science for All. If you have a 10% increase followed by a 10% decrease, do you get back where you were? And what if you had a 10% increase followed by a 5% decrease? Do you have a 5% increase overall? Now the answer. To understand what's going on here, what we can do is to act like physicists. What I mean by that is that we can study what's going on when we look at extreme values. Let's consider a 100% increase followed by a 100% decrease. Then I would move from 100 coins to 200. And then I would have a 100% decrease of 200 coins, which gives me zero. And that's because a 100% decrease is always subtracting everything. You lose 100% of what you have, so you always have nothing. So quite surprisingly, if you have a 100% increase followed by a 100% decrease, well overall you have a 100% decrease, which is really not a 0% increase. Now let's look at what happens if I have a 20% increase followed by a 10% decrease. Well, it means that I'm going to add two columns and subtract one row. And I'm left with 108 coins. That's nearly the 10% increase I could expect, but not quite. Why is that? In fact, if you compute diverse combinations of increases and decreases, they never add up. But if the increases and the decreases are very small, they almost do. What's happening here? After a 20% increase, my number of coins will have been multiplied of all by 1 plus 20%. And now if I have a 10% decrease, well, I'm going to multiply all I have now by 1 minus 10%. Now I'm going to do something a little bit tricky here. I'm going to replace this 10% by x, in which case 20% is 2 times x. And so overall what I get is that my number of coins gets multiplied by 1 plus 2x times 1 minus x. Now if I arrange that, I get 1 plus x minus 2x squared. Now if I look only at this part, the 1 plus x part, then it's what I would expect if I can, could just add up the increase and the decrease. But I'm making a mistake here, and this term, this x squared term, this 2x squared term, is exactly this mistake. And now the key thing to notice is that if x is small, then x squared is very small. In fact, it's going to be much smaller than x. And so what physicists do, as well as economists and biologists and all the applied mathematical scientists do, is to remove this term when x is small, about 10% or, or smaller. So they're making a mistake here, but crucially what you get in the end, up to this mistake, is extremely simple. You can add up increases and decreases up to this small error. And this is called linearization. Now this is very exciting because linearization is a cornerstone of all of science. Really, it's used everywhere and it's really important to understand what are the consequences of using linearization. In fact, it is essential to linearize all equations to be able to solve them and do something with them, to do the computations required to have technological solutions to, for instance, sending someone to the moon. If we were to use Einstein's theory of general relativity without doing any linearization, it would be hopeless for us to send someone to the moon. The calculations would be just too, too hard to handle. And similarly, in all kinds of science, linearity is ubiquitous. Nearly all the laws of physics to known today are linear. Maxwell's theory of electromagnetism, Newtonian mechanics, special relativity is also extremely linear. Quantum mechanics is all about linearity. Even general relativity has a lot of linearity built in. So linearity is really ubiquitous. And this makes me very suspicious of the whole scientific endeavor. Science proceeds by obtaining data from experiments. Now, these data are usually very messy. But when we look at them in the right way, we sometimes can find a line that describes them very well. 
Now give it enough data and this land is suddenly called a law of physics. However, the theory of linearization tells us that you will usually be able to find that line if you look at the right scales. But on larger scales, this linearization may be totally irrelevant, just like adding increases and decreases was irrelevant for large percentages of increases and decreases. It's a lot like looking at the surface of the Earth and concluding from that that the Earth is flat. This is not true. Now, in this case, we know that it's not true, but sometimes it's much more tricky than that. For instance, let's assume that Superman is flying from right to left and that Batman is walking from left to right. Batman is just not as cool as Superman. If Superman is traveling at 200 km per hour and Batman is running at 50 km per hour, then you would expect Batman to see Superman going at 250 km per hour. Well, guess what? This is false. Speeds do not add up. As explained by Henry Rage in this brilliant video, and despite everything you taught at school, adding speeds is wrong. It is merely a linearization of Einstein's laws of special relativity, and it is completely false if you consider large speeds. So by insisting on using linear equations, we may be doomed to never finding the true laws of our universe. But that's okay, because as John von Neumann once said, if people do not believe that mathematics is simple, it is because they do not realize how complicated life is. Truth is too complicated to allow anything but approximation. Hey, so I hope you've enjoyed this video in which I claimed that the Earth was not flat. And for next time, I want you to think about the question, could the Earth be flat? And, I mean, would it contradict something fundamental in our theory? Or would it be wrong to assert that the Earth is flat? By the way, how do we know that the Earth is not flat in the first place? How can we measure its circumference? How can we do that? I mean, apart from using the very sophisticated tools that we now have. So, is the Earth first? This is the question I want you to think about for next time. You can send me your answers on Facebook, uh, Twitter, Google+, Plus, and subscribe to this channel so that you don't miss the future videos, including this one, which is the answer video on the bottom left of the screen right here. I also put here two articles of uh, Sense for All about uh, linear algebra. If you want to know more about this thing, it's pretty cool. It gets to higher dimensions and stuff like that. In any case, uh, I guess I'll see you uh, next time.